you so much. I want to welcome you to tonight's webinar on uh, Vietnam to Ukraine. The lessons. Let's see, we're getting a little background. If everyone could be sure to mute, that would be great. So the name of our webinar tonight is Vietnam to Ukraine, Lessons for the U.S. Peace Movement. And we're going to be focusing in particular on the massacres at Kent State and uh, Jackson State. So thank you to everyone for logging in to hear this very timely and important panel. A big thank you to the powerhouse speakers that have uh, joined us tonight and to tonight's co-sponsors, the Green Party uh, Peace Action Committee, the People's Network for Planet Justice and Peace, and the Green Parties of Ohio, Missouri, and, and New Jersey. Thank you to our sponsors. Also, thank you to uh, Holly Hart uh, and uh, Tim Bruce, I believe, who are helping on tech tonight, uh, Madeline Hoffman and Chris Mann, who are helping us with timekeeping, and I am Jill Stein. I am not David Swanson, so uh, don't look at my name uh, on the video. I'm facilitating tonight on behalf of the Peace Action Committee. So today is the 53rd anniversary of the tragic and criminal shootings at Kent State, followed 10 days later by the killings at Jackson State. These events marked a watershed in the anti-war movement as they triggered massive student uprisings in the anti-war struggle at a time that the civil rights and the black power movements were also surging. The synergies between these movements uh, was boosted a couple of years earlier by Martin Luther King in his 1967 Viet Beyond Vietnam speech when he called out the United States as the greatest purveyor of violence and he named the triple evil of militarism, racism, and materialism. These fundamental truths inform our struggles today when after 70 plus years of nonstop US military interventions, we are now in a superpower proxy war. This conflict and the war machine behind it are impoverishing and endangering us all and putting the world in unprecedented danger of nuclear confrontation uh, and nuclear winter that could literally starve us all to death, regardless of where the nuclear bombs happen to go off. So the need for a ceasefire and diplomacy is really off the charts, but the US war machine uh, continues to obstruct dialogue, thwarting even Ukraine's expressed interest in negotiations. And domestically now we're seeing uh, absolutely chilling political repression and censorship that makes organizing all the more difficult. Witness, for example, the continuing persecution of Julian Assange for exposing US war crimes, or the recent violent FBI raid and the draconian 15 year prison sentences that the African People's Socialist Party leaders are being threatened with for alleged election interference on behalf of Russia, uh, largely because of their lifelong political beliefs. And there's much more. But the bottom line is that it's going to take a very strong peace movement to change the direction of the US war machine. So tonight we are looking back at the Vietnam era to see if there are lessons that can help us build the momentum to meet this perilous moment. So each of our wonderful speakers is going to uh, have about eight to 10 minutes to address one of the uh, dimensions of the Vietnam era. And I'll be introducing each speaker before they talk. And you can post questions or comments at any time in the chat. And we ask you to please be courteous in the chat so it doesn't become a distraction, in which case the powers that be might decide to shut it off. So um, after we have heard from the speakers, I will make a few comments followed by an open Q&A for a half hour. So with that, let's begin. Um, Margaret Kimberly 
is executive editor of the Black Agenda Report and author of the book, Prejudential, Black America and the Presidents. In addition to being a coordinating committee member of the Black Alliance for Peace, she is an administrative committee member of UNAC, the United National Anti-War Coalition, and the board of directors of the U.S. Peace Memorial Foundation. And she is a member of the New York State Green Party. So over to you, Margaret. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you, Jill. Uh, thank you all. Greetings and thank you for joining us and for being patient. Uh, on the day of the Kent State shootings on May 4th, 1970, I was just 10 and a half years old. But even though I was very young, I knew I was living in an extraordinary time. Most of my young life, I had already witnessed the Black Liberation Movement mass protests. Uh, I Two years earlier, I uh, recalled the assassinations of Martin Luther King and then Robert Kennedy. The war in Vietnam was questioned by more and more people with huge marches, such as the moratorium march in late 1969. There were teach-ins and sit-ins and popular culture even joined in with the show called Laugh-In. I also remember the killings of Fred Hampton and Mark Clark, Black Panther Party members in Chicago in December 1969, and many Black people were members or supporters of the BPP. There was still a draft then, and draft cards were burned and draft offices were raided. The following year, 18-year-olds were given the right to vote in an admission that if 18-year-olds could go to war, they should also get the franchise. And a few years later, no one was drafted anymore because the issue of conscription had been a flash point for protest. In my home, we were riveted not only by the killing of four students at Kent State, but how it became another occasion for division. My family followed the news closely. We were encouraged to do as our parents did. And I recall my older sister reading the paper and telling me that there were people who rejoiced in the students' deaths and even sent their families hate mail. As Black people, we were fixated on the fact that the Ohio National Guard shot and killed young white people. In our household, we mourn the loss and no one who can remember that year will forget the haunting photo of a 14-year-old Marianne Vecchio over the body of Jeffrey Miller. It mm -hmm. became iconic. Mm -hmm. One of the striking things about this moment was that the Black Liberation Movement and the anti-war movement and the counterculture all became melded together. They fed upon each other with many people involved in all of these dynamics. But while we were still in shock about Kent State, less than two weeks later, we lived through killings on another college camp campus, Jackson State, an historically black college in Jackson, Mississippi, was the scene of uh, the crime where two young black men were killed by police during a protest not against the war, but against the racism that they lived with daily. My members of Jackson State are less vivid and I think that is because it received less attention. Coming just 10 days after Kent State and with black victims, it just wasn't considered very important. There's mourning about that time and there's also nostalgia. I think especially among those of us who act on behalf of peace and protest against our state when it kills people around the world. That era is seen as the heyday of protest and the time when, and is remembered as a time when millions of people knew they could impact events at home and around the world. It's true that mass mobilization brought about the end of Jim Crow segregation, but we forget that many people paid a high price. King was not the only victim of assassination. Some uh, uh, people whose names we don't know also lost their lives. Some lost jobs or housing or were imprisoned. There are still Black Panthers and others from that era in prison. Some like Rochelle McGee in California has been in prison since 1921, 1971 and the attempt to break George Jackson out of jail. And it's then that we all learn the name Angela Davis. It's true that political activity led to other actions on behalf of the environment. The first Earth Day was celebrated just 12, day, 12 days before the Kent State shootings. Mm -hmm. Huge protests and a political formation which targeted polluters for political defeat 
resulted in the establishment of the Environmental Protection Agency. Agency. But if, even then, we saw the limits of popular action. U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War went on for another three years, during which time Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger expanded the war to Laos and Cambodia. Um, King was assassinated exactly one year after he publicly, publicly condemned the war in Vietnam. And in that time, he was vilified by corporate media, including and perhaps especially by papers like the New York Times and the Washington Post, he was considered an interloper who had forgotten his place when he dared to speak about foreign policy. In 1970, also Lieutenant William Calley and others went on trial for murdering more than 100 Vietnamese civilians at a village called My Lai. The story was broken by a freelance writer named Seymour Hirsch, who won a Pulitzer Prize for his reporting. Hirsch is still with us now in his late 80s and still breaking stories. Three months ago, he reported that the Biden administration sabotaged the Nord Stream pipeline, committing an act of war against Germany, said to be an ally of the US. But now Hirsch is ignored. Major media who followed his reporting on My Lai refused to acknowledge the 5,000 word article that he wrote about Nord Stream, dismissing it as a blog post, if they acknowledge it at all. 1970 might have been the heyday in some ways, but we have gone backwards in others. The liberation movement led to the mass incarceration system, an effort to replace what was lost when Jim Crow was made illegal. At that time, there were about 300,000 incarcerated people in the United States. There are now more than 2 million and half of them are black. In 1970, no one knew the word COINTELPRO, the FBI's counterintelligence program. But the following year, a group of brave people broke into an FBI office in Pennsylvania and their stolen documents revealed COINTELPRO's existence. The FBI surveilled every black community in the country, sp spied on King and others, created dissension and killed Black Panthers and others. So we have reasons to be nostalgic for this heady time when so much seemed possible but we also have to acknowledge what went wrong. I think we have to thank the Vietnamese people rather than pat USCN protesters on the back. It was their determination in Vietnam which sent the US packing and kept it from any large scale foreign adventures for another 20 years. There was nothing like it until the Iraq wars. But in 2003, we saw another US war overseas despite the protests of millions of people. It became very unpopular though and forced the war makers to find a new face, Barack Obama, who could make war in a more stealthy way. He knew that people in this country didn't want to send young people off to die and he accelerated the proxy war, making common cause with right-wing neo-Nazis in Ukraine uh, who brought down an elected president, working with jihadists to destroy Libya and attempting to do the same in mm -hmm. Syria. Millions, can someone mute please? Millions of people took to the streets again in 2020 after a man named George Floyd was murdered by police. But that movement quickly disappeared and last year more than 1100 people were killed by police. I wanna say that all of these actions were right and righteous and brought about positive change for millions of people. But I think we should have learned that reform will not do. Recently, four members of the African People's Socialist Party were recently indicted and charged with being Russian agents when they expressed views opposing the state narratives about Ukraine. Shades of COINTELPRO yet again. The people we protest again against were also determined, determined not to see another era like the 60s and early 70s. And so I'm gonna close by saying we must acknowledge the need for truly revolutionary change. People spoke of revolution very openly, constantly around 1970, and they knew what they were talking about. So I think we must remember all of the actions that were taken at that time. We have to remember the limitations, remember the uh, uh, suppression and the reaction that came afterwards. So even as we plan the next march, 
even as we think about how we must address all the injustices in the world, I think we have to face that we need revolutionary change. Not a small thing, but something that we must be acknowledge and begin planning for. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, very powerful words and uh, uh, I, I think you've 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 spoken truth to power. Bravo. Yes, bravo, everyone. Thank you. Um, I'm very excited to hear our next speaker and tell me if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I believe it is Cele McGinnis. Is that correct? That's called Cele. Cele. Okay. All right, great. So Cele is a poet, a short star story writer a retired instructor of English at Jackson State University, former editor and publisher of Black Magnolia's Literary Journal, and author of eight books, including four collections of poetry, one collection of short fiction, one work of literary criticism, and one co-authored book. He is also the former first runner-up for the Amiri Baraka Sonia Sanchez Poetry Award. And he has been published in magazines, newspapers, and anthologies. So take it away. Thank you so much, Seeley. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> Jackson State University, like most HBCUs, is the epitome of the Black struggle against colonialism. While the vast majority of HBCUs that's historically black colleges and universities are established during or just after reconstruction, they were mired in the American colonial system of segregating and underfunding black people and black institutions so that they never become more than a de facto plantation in which white oppressors control the curriculum to control the intellectual aptitude and economic progress of African-Americans. One example of this is that well into the 1970s, Mississippi's three public HBCUs, Jackson State, Alcorn, and Mississippi Valley, had to get approval from the State College Board just to invite speakers to the campus. In most aspects, Jackson State didn't have the autonomy to decide its own educational direction. However, thanks to great leaders and professors, such as former president, Dr. John A. Peoples, poet, Dr. Mark, poet and novelist, Dr. Margaret Walker Alexander, and others, Jackson State was able to circumvent Mississippi's educational apartheid and become one of only 11 HBCUs to achieve Research II status. In fact, Jackson State is the second oldest Research II HBCU in the country. Additionally, Jackson State was part of what some call the Civil Rights Triangle, as Jackson State, the COFO building, and Mega Evans' office as the head of the Mississippi NAACP were all on the same street diagonal from each other forming a triangle. So just off the campus of Jackson State was the COFO building, which served as the headquarters for Freedom Summer of 1964 and attracted many Jackson State students as volunteers. And of course, many Jackson State students were part of the NAACP youth branch because Megan Evans was instrumental in organizing them into the movement. But as y'all can imagine, this didn't sit well with the majority white college board and the majority white state legislature of Mississippi. Which led, the, which led to additional cuts in funding and the general harassment of students and teachers that culminated into the 1970 shooting in which the Mississippi National Guard surrounded the campus and the Mississippi Highway Patrol and the Jackson Police Department marched onto the campus, firing over 400 rounds into a female dormitory, injuring 18 and killing two, Philip Lafayette Gibbs and James Earl Green. Connecting this event to tonight's discussion, it's important to understand that the Jackson State student movement included several Vietnam veterans, such as my father, who had returned home and enrolled in college, determined to make the country live up to his democratic creed, for which they were erroneously fighting in foreign lands. But I want to be clear, the night of May 15, 1970 shooting, there was nothing happening on the campus that would have warranted the presence of law enforcement. The shooting was an unmitigated attack on Jackson State as the symbol of Black people using education to become sovereign beings. And the presence of unnecessary law enforcement on the Jackson State campus is no different than the presence of unnecessary military forces in Vietnam and anywhere else our forces have been deployed 
solely to establish or maintain America's colonial regime. Continuing the work of my father and other Mississippi veterans of the civil rights movement, I have worked in three ways to illuminate this history, teach this history, and use this history to inspire others to become active in resisting oppression in all forms. As a creative writer, I have published poems and short stories about the 1970 attack on DSU by local law enforcement and the general history and struggle of Jackson State. As an essayist, I have published articles about the causes and aftermath of the 1970 attack on Jackson State and the continued struggle of the institution against white supremacist policies. As a teacher at Jackson State, one of the prompts of my composition literature classes cause and effect paper was what was the cause of the 1970 attack on Jackson State. As such, many of my students got to research and write about this history. And finally, as a teacher, I was active in and testified during the federal proceedings of the Ayers case, in which Mississippi Street public HBCUs sued the state for its discriminatory funding practice. In all of my work, especially as a creative writer, the Vietnam era and the US and the United States peace movement have taught me four things. One, silence is the friend of evil. Two, local, national, and international politics are collaborative, if not one and the same, especially as it relates to the government funding wars to expand its empire rather than funding education, health, and employment initiatives to provide equality to its own citizens. Three, there is no way that a government can engage or execute unjust actions at home or abroad and be deemed as a just entity. And four, when the people remember that they are the government and that elected officials work for them, then and only then will we be able to elect representatives and establish policies that nurture peace rather than colonialism. And I thank you guys for having me. Thank you so much, uh, Silly. That was awesome. Bravo. We're applauding you. More truth to power. Really well said. Our next speaker is, um, let's see, David Swanson. You are next up. David is an author, an activist, a journalist, and a radio host. He is executive director of World Beyond War. And he is campaign director for Roots Action. His books include War is a Lie. You can read his blogs at davidswanson.org and warisacrime.org. He hosts Talk World Radio. He is a Nobel Peace Prize nominee and a US Peace Prize recipient. You can also follow him uh, on his Twitter at David C. N. Swanson. So take it away, David. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, David. Uh, my name is Jill Stein. I'm. Uh, <laughs> that, that was uh, that was terrific, as always, from Margaret, and uh, tremendous from from C. Lee. I, I'm I'm going to be brief and generalize and give some tentative conclusions to try to fit into ten minutes what I think happened in Vietnam and what I think some of the key lessons are for peacemaking now from peacemaking at that time, the time of what the Vietnamese called the American War. I think that the US public has been much more aware from that time to now of the extent to which the US government is principally the world's primary war machine. We all sometimes get some facts wrong, sometimes exaggerate, some make the mistake of imagining that the rest of the world's war makers are admirable, just as some peace activists made the mistake, I believe, of cheering for the Vietnamese side of the war on Vietnam, though they had the excuse we do not of far less knowledge of the superior power of nonviolent action. Now, as everyone prepares to ask me how a friendly little sit-in can stop bombs from landing on your head, I encourage you to envision a completely different approach of non-cooperation with occupation and to see the list of successes at worldbeyondwar.org slash list. But mostly, I think people fail to quite grasp the extent to which the U.S. government is responsible for the institution of war. In the latest numbers on military spending, out of 230 other countries, the US spends more than 227 of them combined. 
Russia and China spend a combined 21% of what the US and its allies spend on war. Since 1945, the US military has acted in a major or minor way in 74 other countries. At least 95% of foreign military bases on earth are US bases. Out of those 230 other countries, the US exports more weaponry than 228 of them combined. Most places with wars manufacture no weapons. The war on Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia remains the worst thing the US military has done. The US dropped more than three times the bombs it had in World War II, combined with a massive ground war, plus the spraying from the air of tens of millions of liters of Agent Orange, not to mention napalm. Tens of millions of bombs remain unexploded and increasingly dangerous today. An estimated 3.8 million people died violently just in Vietnam. Some 19 million were wounded or made homeless in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Many millions more were forced to live dangerous and impoverished lives with impacts lasting to today. The U.S. soldiers who did 1.6% of the dying, but whose suffering dominates U.S. movies about the war, really did suffer as much and as horribly as depicted. Thousands of veterans have since committed suicide. But imagine what that means for the true extent of the suffering created, even just for humans, ignoring all the other species impacted. The Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C. lists 58,000 names on 150 meters of wall. That's 387 names per meter. To similarly list 4 million names would require 10,336 meters, or the distance from the Lincoln Memorial to the steps of the U.S. Capitol, and back again, and back to the Capitol once more, and then back as far as all the museums, but stopping short of the Washington Monument. To get U.S. society to not think it would be insane to put Vietnamese names on the Vietnam Memorial would require a revolution of values. In Laos, about a third of the country's land remains ruined by the heavy presence of unexploded bombs, which continue to kill large numbers of people and which were originally intended to wipe out farms to starve people or were simply littering by bombers unable to get to Vietnam due to the weather. Then there's the growth of the Khmer Rouge as much a result of war as ISIS or the empowerment of right-wingers in Ukraine and Russia. Then there are all the results for the U.S. and the world that I must leave to other speakers today. The financial trade-offs, the bigotry, the violent culture, the damage to the ideas of law and cooperation, and also not necessarily a bad thing, the boost to independence and resistance to U.S. domination around the world. What have we learned? To some extent, we've learned and not forgotten that governments lie. But we still talk about a war based on lies as if some other war could be based on something else. We've started to learn that a Venn diagram of human decency and government interests would have a tiny and bizarre overlap. We've come to understand that governments are rarely moved by moral arguments, but we've also largely failed to learn that the public pressure needed to move governments is itself very much driven by moral arguments, as it was successfully during the war on Vietnam. During the wars since Vietnam, U.S. peace activists have generally failed to tell the U.S. public that wars are immoral, one-sided slaughters. Choosing to focus on the damage the wars have been doing to U.S. troops and the financial cost to taxpayers. This is the boomerang result of the spitting lies and other wild tales and exaggerations of mistakes of blaming the rank and file troops who destroyed Vietnam. A smart peace movement, its elders have believed, would stress sympathizing with troops to the point of not telling anyone what the basic nature of the wars was. Of course, anything can be used against you by an ever worsening media. But even as polling shows that people in the United States care less and less about patriotism, competing pro and anti-war rallies I witnessed on a sunny day in Crawford, Texas some years back were nearly indistinguishable swarms of U.S. flags. 
when we've reached the point of not being allowed to mention that mass shooters are disproportionately veterans or of cheering for a veteran who murders a man on a subway, we are in danger not so much of creating prejudices against veterans, many of whom are wonderful peace activists, as of glorifying participation in mass murder. By the way, I think the Washington Post and Secretary of State Blinken should hold a conference on those foot-dragging developing nations where the backward governments will charge you with murder merely for killing people on subways. That would show them. Young people, in particular, do not require flags or crosses or political parties to believe that slaughtering families is worth standing up against. But someone has to tell them that families are being slaughtered, and not only by Russia. During the war on Vietnam, peace activists did that. The media, awful as it was, was better than now. People in the U.S. saw a U.S. ally shoot someone in the head. But did they know that that shooter was brought to Northern Virginia to live near the CIA for decades, neighbor to the once and hoped for future royalty of Afghanistan and Iran, and not to mention the one true unelected president of Venezuela, the would-be ruler of Libya, and a whole prop room of puppets. What we need to learn most is that difficult and confused as it was and is, activism worked. One, a vote to end the bombing of Cambodia, swayed public opinion, dominated politics, helped force through a progressive agenda of domestic policies, and helped compel Congress to hold a president accountable in a manner that seems thoroughly foreign to the U.S. Congress today, as does the integration of peace as part of a package of sane transformations away from racism, sexism, authoritarianism, consumerism, etc., we need to learn that uncomfortably large coalitions work better than prioritizing canceling people, that changing an entire culture works, that placing peace over political party works, that youth get things done, that peace should be made part of human identity, not just a passing topic in the news. That this was done during the war on Vietnam is evident from how many current peace activists were peace activists then. Many, such as Daniel Ellsberg, a whistleblower then, not with us much longer. The cultural change was so great that the warmongers called it an illness, the Vietnam syndrome, and then they partially cured the country of it. Unfortunately, it was not an illness, but a wellness on which all life depends. We need to unlearn this weird idea that a draft is a tool of peace. Drafts facilitate wars. The warmongers want one. The Democrats want women forced to register. The Vietnam War not only persisted for many years during the draft, killing far more people than any U.S. war since, but also continued for two years after the draft ended. Yes, people opposed a war with a draft who say nothing about a proxy war or a drone war, but I'd like to use education and organizing to try to get them active before resorting to a tool that kills millions and risks apocalypse. In 1965, there was a song called Nowhere to Run To. Tribes of humans used to be able to flee each other. Then they filled the habitable land. Refugees used to be able to flee danger for a land with a secure future. In 1849, a man could mail himself in a box from Richmond to Philadelphia and freedom. In 1958, a black journalist could escape Mississippi to Chicago in a casket. There's no escaping a world hell bent on nuclear or environmental destruction. Delusions of space travel will not help you. Our only help is to learn what's worked and adapt and improve it. People come up to me at peace events and tell me all is already hopeless. But if they believed that, they would not be there. Our job is not to predict the future, but to change it as much as we can. Thank you. Wow. Bravo. Thank you, David. So much truth here. It's... Um... Um, I could take uh, a long time listening over and over again to all these incredibly powerful and uplifting words. Um, right now, we're going to jump into our next speaker, Paul Cox. And 
Paul sent me this for an introduction. He was patrolling the embattled rice paddies south of Da Nang on May 4th, 1970, the day of the uh, Kent State uh, massacres. He was a grunt in the Marines and he didn't hear about the massacres at Kent State for a couple of weeks. It was disturbing news when it arrived and it contributed significantly to his turning against the Vietnam War and the US society's vicious hubris. So we're going to hear more about that now. Thank you so much, Paul, for joining us. And uh, thank you. Make a quick, quick announcement. Um, I'm sending you reminders of time through direct message because I need to keep my microphone off. So I was trying to do that to the other speakers. It's connected, okay? I just want you to keep your eye out open for that. Thank you. Trust me, I won't take 10 minutes. Uh, a little bit more about uh, about me. I'm on the National Board of Veterans for Peace, and uh, and I'm also the president of the Veterans Healthcare Policy Institute, which is trying to prevent uh, privatization of the VA, uh, mm -hmm. which is, is going along full blast at this point. Um, and you know, there are people who don't think the VA that, that the veterans get a really good deal. We do, and what we would like for that for the VA to become is a is for a um, an exemplar of how national health care should be uh, performed in this country. So it's not just us that we're fighting for. But so I was, you know, I was raised in Oklahoma. Uh, I got drafted in 68. Um, I didn't know anything about the war, except that there was one. And I went and joined the Marine Corps because I got my draft notes. Um, and I was one of the rank and file troops that, that David uh, spoke so eloquently about. Um, but 14 days before Kent State, uh, I turned against the war all of a sudden. I'd already been there over a year. Uh, mm -hmm. But when we marched, when my unit, Bravo Company, 1st Battalion, 5th Marines, marched into a village and the point squad gunned down the first 15 people they saw, killed them. Uh, that was when I suddenly realized there's something wrong here. And I've been against the war ever since. And certainly the Kent State Massacre and the Jackson State Slaughter. I, I never heard that there were 400 rounds shot in Jackson State. Thank you so much for that, um, uh it, it really, it, it, it just solidified that there is, that this country has some very serious problems. And I've lived by that thought ever since. Um, I don't know about drawing a whole lot of li uh, lessons about the, the Vietnam War versus Ukraine, but there may be a few and they've kind of some people have kind of mentioned them before. I think the draft, um, you know, there was a huge anti-war movement during the Vietnam War within the military. It was huge. And uh, Waging Peace uh, exhibit, if you get a chance to see it or you want to look it up, the book by uh, Ron Carver and others. Uh, it gives you a fair overview of the hundreds and thousands of veterans, GIs and veterans who were opposed to that war. It wasn't just Vietnam veterans against the war. It was people in the military, such as me. Uh, I worked on an anti-war newspaper for the last two years I was in the Marines. I was in four long, long years. But the last two years, we put out a newspaper called Rage at Camp Lejeune and raised a bunch of hackles with the brass. And, you know. They didn't do much about it. They couldn't. There were too many of us. Um, now we have this volunteer army where they, they get some poor chump to sign up, uh, you know, say this is a great career. He gets married. He has a day job. He's in the National Guard. And then they deploy him and deploy him and deploy him again because the empire requires its fodder. And that's not that's that's uh, that's very different. Um, and it is hard that we've not been able to organize in the last 10 years, 20 years, much in the way of a GI movement uh, within the military, simply because those people buy into the fact that, hey, you signed the line and you got to do what you're told. Now, there are plenty of young young veterans getting out of the military these days that are opposed to war. But they really very, very, very few of them actually stand up in the military and say no. And that's that's a problem, because if you could get the military from, from to, to stop doing what it's told to do, 
then you've got some, you've got some leverage that can be very powerful. And I do think that the GI movement was part of, not all, certainly not all, maybe not the most, part of the anti-war movement in this country that helped us get out of the war finally. Um, also have to give kudos to the Vietnamese who weren't going to stop forever, but that's another thing. Um, I think another element of this is that the, 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 the Vietnam War was similar to the, the current war because it was largely a proxy war. As David pointed out, there's only 58,000 Americans killed. Not that many, really, in the, in the scheme of things, even though we cry about it a lot. But it, wasn't, it was a tiny fraction of the number of people who were killed in the war. Uh, the Ukraine war is absolutely a proxy war. We had some mercenary killed last week, and I don't know if there have been any others in this whole damn war. But that's, that's what's happening, is that this, they, we've figured out between drones and long distance artillery and rockets and getting a proxy army to do your slaughtering for you that's a whole lot better thing and we and what it means is that the ammo pipeline is going full blast again we let it get a little slow after the vietnam war and now by god if you read the news oh we got to get we got to get more stuff we got to we got to build a whole lot more stuff so there's that. And I, I don't know, I, it, you know, corporate militarism, I think, is the is the big thing. The military industrial complex, the mic um, is we got to go after those people because they're criminals and they know it and they don't care what happens to Ukraine. They don't care what happens to this country as long as they can make their high profits. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Bravo. Paul, thank you. And thank you for your real service in shutting down the war machine. Since then, yes. Yes, yes. And and what you did in in the jaws of that war machine as well, which took incredible heroism and sacrifice. So thank thank you so much. So next we are going to our last speaker here. And this is uh, Haig Hovannis. Am I saying that correctly, Haig? I am not hearing you. Let's see, Haig, are you? Yes, that's close enough, Joe. Okay, all right, great. Just wanna be sure I could hear you. Um, so Haig is a peace activist with a professional background in information technology. He's the co-chair of the Peace Action Committee of the Green Party of the United States, and he has written and presented on a variety of defense-related technology issues, and he is definitely one of the people who keeps this committee um, alive and well and as productive as it has managed to be, um, along with uh, Madeline uh, who I'll also give uh, kudos to as well. So take it away, Haig. Haig is going to talk about, um, he is going to give a tribute to uh, the Supreme Whistleblower of the Vietnam era. Go ahead. Yes, and uh, I'd like to share my screen. <clears throat> I have just a couple slides to put up. If the uh, <clears throat> Zoom Lord can enable that. Yes, you are being made a co-host, so you should be able to share your screen. You should find the option. All right. Can people see that? Uh, we're not seeing. There we go. Yeah. All right. Uh, <clears throat> today, I will pay tribute to Daniel Ellsberg, a man who's been called one of the most significant whistleblowers in American history. He sacrificed his career and risked his freedom to bring to light the truth about the Vietnam War and spent subsequent years working for peace. In March, Dan posted online a letter announcing that he'd been diagnosed with terminal cancer and is likely to die this year. This is a fitting time to appreciate his life's work. Daniel Ellsberg was born in 1931 in Chicago. He attended Harvard University where he graduated summa cum laude and later earned a PhD in economics. <clears throat> After leaving Harvard, he worked for the Rand Corporation, a think tank that was heavily involved in military research. It was during his time at Rand that Ellsberg became involved in the Vietnam War. 
At first, Ellsberg supported the war, but as he began to study the conflict more closely, and after speaking with war resistors, he became increasingly disillusioned. He discovered that the government was lying to the American people about the progress of the war, and he became convinced that the war was unwinnable. In 1969, Ellsberg made the decision to leak the Pentagon Papers, a top secret study of the Vietnam War that had been commissioned by the Department of Defense. The study showed that the government had lied to the American people about the progress of the war, and it revealed that the government had been involved in secret operations in Laos and Cambodia. After fruitless attempts to interest members of Congress in the report, he provided the documents to the New York Times, which published excerpts in 1971. The revelations in the papers were significant and damaging to the US government as they revealed that successive administrations had systematically lied to the American people about the progress and objectives of the war. The Pentagon Papers showed that the US government had secretly escalated its military involvement in Vietnam without a clear strategy for victory. The papers also revealed that government officials had deliberately misled the public about the nature of the conflict, the extent of US military involvement, and the prospects for success. The publication of the Pentagon Papers was a turning point in American history. It revealed the government's lies about the war and shook the American people's faith in their leaders. It also led to a Supreme Court ruling that upheld the right of the press to publish classified information. Ellsberg's actions had serious consequences. He was charged with theft and espionage, and he faced the possibility of spending the rest of his life in prison. But in a stunning turn of events, the charges against him were dismissed when it was revealed that the government engaged in illegal wiretapping and other forms of surveillance against him. The dropping of charges against Ellsberg was a significant victory for whistleblowers and the freedom of the press, and it underscored the importance of government transparency and accountability. Ellsberg's bravery and commitment to the truth made him a hero to peace activists and a prominent voice in the anti-war community. For decades, he, was, he has continued to speak out on issues of war, peace, and government secrecy. He was a vocal critic of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and he remains critical of US militaristic foreign policy that is fomenting and sustaining armed conflict in many regions today. The release of the Pentagon Papers overshadowed Ellsberg's parallel efforts to expose the dangerous consequences of America's nuclear weapons planning. In the 1970s, his attempts to release classified materials on the danger of nuclear war were frustrated by the accidental loss of a trove of classified documents related to the nuclear threat. Eventually, he was able to reassemble this information and publish it in 2017 in the book, The Doomsday Machine. The Doomsday Machine is a detailed expose of the US government's nuclear war policy during the Cold War. Ellsberg reveals that the US had a policy of using nuclear weapons preemptively, including against non-nuclear countries, and that this policy remained in effect even after the end of the Cold War. He also revealed that the US had regularly threatened adversaries with use of nuclear weapons. Ellsberg exposed a dangerous culture of secrecy and lack of accountability surrounding US nuclear policy. He revealed that the US had developed plans for a first strike nuclear attack on the Soviet Union, even in the absence of a Soviet attack, which he argues would have led to the deaths of millions of people. Ellsberg further revealed that the US government had delegated authority to use nuclear weapons far more widely than was known to the public, greatly increasing the danger of accidental nuclear war. He argued that the poorly managed nuclear arsenal of the United States constituted a doomsday machine that represented an existential threat to humanity. The book provides a stark warning about the dangers of nuclear weapons and the need for greater transparency and accountability in nuclear policy to prevent a catastrophic global disaster. The work to which Ellsberg has devoted most of his life remains unfinished. Little has changed in the belligerent foreign policy of the United States since the Vietnam era. The danger of nuclear war is greater than ever. A NATO proxy war is raging in Europe, and Washington is engaged in provocations aimed at starting a war with China over Taiwan. As in the Vietnam era, our government lies about its actions and conceals dangerous activities behind walls of secrecy and mass media propaganda. 
Today, the US government continues to prosecute whistleblowers aggressively. Many have been jailed and some like Edward Snowden have fled to avoid rigged trials. Julian Assange continues to languish in prison awaiting extradition and possible lifetime imprisonment. But in the words of Assange, courage is contagious and leaks will continue as government misdeeds are exposed by principled people. The voluminous information Ellsberg photocopied over many hours can be copied today in minutes and distributed worldwide immediately over the internet. We have already seen such leaks in the form of classified US information on the war in Ukraine, contradicting optimistic US public claims. The exemplary actions of Dan Ellsberg will inspire countless future acts of courage in the cause of peace. I would like to conclude by reading a portion of the letter in which Dan announced his illness and terminal diagnosis. Dear friends and supporters, I have difficult news to impart. On February 17, without much warning, I was diagnosed with inoperable pancreatic cancer on the basis of a CT scan and an MRI. I'm sorry to report to you that my doctors have given me three to six months to live. Of course, they emphasize that everyone's case is individual. It might be more or less. I feel lucky and grateful that I've had a wonderful life far beyond the proverbial three score years and 10. I'll be 92 on April 7th. I feel the very same way about having a few months more to enjoy life with my wife and family and in which to continue to pursue the urgent goal of working with others to avert nuclear war in Ukraine or Taiwan or anywhere else. When I copied the Pentagon Papers in 1969, I had every reason to think I would be spending the rest of my life behind bars. It was a fate I would gladly have accepted if it meant hastening the end of the Vietnam War, unlikely as that seemed and was. Yet in the end, that action, in ways I could not have foreseen due to Nixon's illegal responses, did have an impact on shortening the war. In addition, thanks to Nixon's crimes, I was spared the imprisonment I expected, and I was able to spend the last 50 years with Patricia and my family, and with you, my friends. What's more, I was able to devote those years to doing everything I could think of to alert the world to the perils of nuclear war and wrongful interventions lobbying, lecturing, writing, and joining with others in acts of protest and nonviolent resistance. I'm happy to know that millions of people, including all those friends and comrades to whom I address this message, have the wisdom, the dedication, and the moral courage to carry on with these causes and to work unceasingly for the survival of our planet and its creatures. I'm enormously grateful to have had the privilege of knowing and working with such people past and present. That's among the most treasured aspects of my very privileged and very lucky life. I want to thank you all for the love and support you have given me in so many ways. Your dedication, courage, and determination to act have inspired and sustained my own efforts. My wish for you is that at the end of your days, you will feel as much joy and gratitude as I do now. Signed, Daniel Ellsberg. Before one of the battles of the Civil War, a Union officer asked his soldiers, if this man should fall, who will lift the flag and carry on? Daniel Ellsberg courageously carried the flag of peace. I ask all of you to join me in lifting that flag and carrying on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Haig. So applause and kudos. Beautiful. Um, I'm only going to make a couple of short comments, but while I do, I encourage people to please put your um, comments that you would like to share or questions into the chat, and then we will launch into the chat in just a few minutes. Um, and at this point, I just want to say, you know, bravo, truth to power on so many different dimensions. Um, when I was reviewing the, the events of the Vietnam era in preparation for this discussion, it just brought home to me how many kind of different dimensions were all converging and the different movements and the different kind of um, little slices of humanity that were all 
standing up in their own unique and incredibly powerful ways. Um, the anti-war movement, the GIs who were incredibly powerful, Paul, as you were saying, the coffee house movement and the newspapers. And there was just so much moral authority. And there were so many of them. And Daniel Ellsberg himself said that, um, you know, the reason he decided to risk it all was because he was so inspired by um, young people who were saying no to the draft and going to jail. And, you know, courage indeed is contagious, you know. And then the very powerful um, experience of the Black community and the Black liberation, the uh, Black power movement and the civil rights movement and the incredible abuse that they were experiencing that was written all over our newspapers and our media back in the day when that kind of thing was shown and we saw the kids being um, attacked by dogs in Birmingham and being uh, overpowered with the fire hoses. You know, it was just so powerful. Um, so there was, there was that, then there was the student movement, you know, and the power of uh, what happened at Kent State and the tragedy at Jackson State and just this upsurge of youth energy. And, you know, like Margaret, well, I guess, I was a little ahead of Margaret because I was in college as this was happening. And, um, uh, you know, I have to say, I was I was standing on street corners protesting the war from the time I was in high school, which was like before it was even a thing. But I didn't know very much about it. I was just kind of doing it because it seemed really wrong. Why are we killing people in Vietnam who aren't threatening us in any way? That's about all I knew, but it just seemed wrong. Um, but then, you know, I was in college when we occupied University Hall uh, and the university was shut down and then we had a free university. And what was just so powerful was that we kept seeing the message coming from these in, in different languages really, and with different art and uh, kind of with, with different vision. And it just came together in a way that was so incredible and amazing. And it's really wonderful uh, on this panel to hear from you know, sectors that we're not in touch with. And in the same way that the Vietnam era brought us all in touch, um, you know, we kind of need to do that now. And that was sort of like to me and looking for what's the lesson, you know, the lessons are not clear cut, but maybe that's one of them that we just need to, um, you know, cross the streams like in Ghostbusters, you know, we just need to, we need to be intersecting and, um, and collaborating and feeling our way forward together. Uh, we had the benefit in the Vietnam era of the draft, the benefit and the horror of the draft, but it sure did you know, mobilize people and move people to do incredibly courageous things. We don't have that draft right now. And you have a lot of people who are going into the military because of the economic draft. And so they're, they're, they have very mixed allegiances about it. Um, you know, and, and on that score, it seems really important for us to be educating people that there is, the threat is not so much the draft, the threat is that we are, it's not even a threat, it's a reality that we are being impoverished by the war and the military machine, but we're not only being impoverished, we're also being endangered. And in that sense, it's kind of like the draft, we're being endangered by the reality of the nuclear threat and the fact that by the hour we are marching towards nuclear confrontation under leadership that's incredibly clueless and reckless and a moral abomination. And uh, like Margaret said, we need really a revolutionary change. You know, this, we, the war may have ended much due to the power of the Vietnamese people um, who got the war, you know, who sort of forced the war to an end, but that was very much helped by our movement. Um, but we can, we can empower our movement now by bringing these different direct dimensions together and especially educating people that uh, the nuclear threat and nuclear winter is a reality. I'm just gonna say one thing about that. And that is that one nuclear submarine now contains 4,000 Hiroshima's, 4,000 on one nuclear submarine. And we, the US, have 14 
nuclear submarines. So you can just imagine this is 4,000 times Hiroshima, many times over. We're not going to survive this. And it doesn't take very much to cause a nuclear winter either. Uh, it takes basically 100 Hiroshima bombs. Hiroshima bombs are now considered tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, actual nuclear weapons now are 20 to 50 times as powerful. So basically with the targeting of one large city, that alone could contain enough uh, nuclear winter right there in one city being struck. So the threshold for nuclear winter is low and we are all at risk for that because uh, it doesn't matter where the bombs go off, nuclear winter is everywhere. So, you know, it really helps for us to let people know that we are all in the target hairs of both this economic calamity as well as the um, actual physical harm, the real threat of war. We're all in the target hairs right now of this war. And for us to be, I think, just uh, drawing on the power of these different voices and these different movements that our speakers have represented tonight is just so powerful. So I really look forward to an ongoing conversation and um, feeling our way forward here to build the movement that our lives depend on. This isn't like a discretionary thing. Um, we need to fight for this movement like we're fighting for our very lives because we actually are. So with that, I'm going to jump into the questions. First, um, we're gonna turn to Madeline Hoffman, one of the other co-chairs of the uh, Green Party Peace Action Committee. And she's going to share a slide about what is going on right now with the Uhuru movement, that is the Africans uh, socialist, uh, African People's Socialist Party, the ones who are under threat, uh, who basically been targeted by the uh, FBI. Margaret uh, also described what was going on with them. Margaret, can we screen share with you? Can you show that slide now? I'm sorry, Madeline. Yes, I, I don't have sharing capability. Um, so I'm just going to put it in the chat. I'm going to put the website in the chat. Um, two people have been uh, arranged already, um, and a third will be arranged shortly. And so I'm just going to put the website in the chat, unless I can get... Madeline, I just... Uh, I can. Okay, I have it now. All Great. right, so thank you. Thank you. So thank you. So this is the... Um, the appeal from the movement, the African People's Socialist Party from Chairman O'Malley Taylor, Shatila. Um, I'm going, I will also post the, the link to the website in the chat so that people can go there to get a link for it. Um, but I did, you know, we did as a as a committee putting this together, um, we decided that, you know, the suppression, the censorship, and the like, that's represented by what's going on with the African Socialist People's Party should not be ignored. And we didn't want to put, um, we couldn't add another panel, panelist, we couldn't speak much longer about this, but I just wanted to do the due diligence here because as other as speakers have already said today, this is chilling, this is potentially, you know, just this has been a long time mission of the African People's Socialist Party uh, to oppose war. Um, and if it can happen to them, it can happen to us, and this should be one of the lessons we take away um, from the, the whole Vietnam War era that we've been talking about to this point. So um, that's it. Uh, it's just it's, an, it's something that's going on right here, right now, and uh, there's dollars needed, there's publicity needed, and we're very happy to um, to have provided a platform for this. And so I can stop sharing. Um, the link is in the chat. 
Thank you, Jill and everyone for the opportunity to say a couple words. Thank you very much, Madeline. And uh, mm -hmm. I'll mention that we've considered maybe uh, doing a dedicated um, uh, webinar uh, about their uh, struggle, how the Uhuru movement is being targeted and maybe the other elements of this uh, vicious, brutal political repression, which is going on right now. It's not confined uh, to them, uh, but they're very much in the target here. So if you are interested in that as a uh, future webinar, let us know in the chat, or if there are other things that you think should be uh, focused on uh, in our coming webinars, please let us know. And I'm going to turn now to the questions and keep uh, posting them, please, um, in the chat. Uh, while we're discussing the ones we have here. Um, let's see. So can someone speak to the tension between racism and militarism, specifically in terms of censorship? Um, there's concern about support for censorship in the guise of silencing hate and silencing uh, uh, attacks that are motivated uh, by virtue of race or gender and so on. Um, and also that, you know, there's concern about disinformation. So all of this uh, contributes to the censorship that's going on. Does someone want to speak to that? How do you sort of balance concerns about uh, limiting hate uh, and hateful communications versus uh, the perils of censorship. Uh, I was always taught that you should always let a fool speak so we can see how foolish that, that fool is. Uh, that's my short answer. Uh, I think the longer answer is that we have to return to understanding that critical thinking and teaching critical thinking at an early level is always gonna be a more effective weapon than shouting people down. I think that once shouting people down became a positive, I just remember my father before he died, and it didn't even matter which side of the aisle. He always thought that it was a very sad moment when college students would shout down a speaker rather than debate a speaker. And so I think that, that that's what we have to return to on both sides of the aisle. And particularly for those of us who think that we are well researched and think that we are critical thinkers, that we have to continue to fight for uh, as much debate, as much dialogue, and truly understand that the empirical process, and I don't hear enough from people on my side talking about the empirical process. And I think that if we begin to include and in teaching and promoting the empirical process, I think that will do a lot to dealing with shouting down people and shouting down people leaving censorship. That's, that's it. Thank you so much, Seeley. And let's see, we have Margaret's hand up and then uh, David Swanson, uh, Swanson's hand. Uh, uh, so go ahead, Margaret. Sure. You know, I'm concerned about... Um, Censorship, a lot of this censorship is under the guise of uh, uh, being benevolent or protecting people. I think the answer is to let everyone speak. Who is censored first? We've seen in the past year with this uh, fake concern about disinformation, which is about silencing people who disagree with the state. That's a particularly accelerated since the war in Ukraine. Um, and it's the black left who were silenced first. People I know who had good shows on because they were on Sputnik or RT are gone. They're disappeared. They're hard to find. Um, then we see big tech working coll collusion. That's a hot word, right? Working with the state to, um, to silence those narratives that the state doesn't like. So every time someone talks about protecting someone or these terrorism laws, or we wanna stop right-wing terrorism, except it's always environmentalists or uh, Black Lives Matter or other activists, we're seeing in Georgia now with the Stop Cop City, people are being charged with domestic terrorism. 
uh, because they don't want this, uh, this cop city and they don't want to destroy this forest. So in general, I would have to say you censor somebody because they yell fire in a crowded theater, because they threaten to kill someone. Aside from that, let everyone speak and give everybody equal at access to the big platforms. Awesome, thank you, Margaret. Um, David, are you gonna to speak to the same question? If there's time, I could very briefly. I, I, yeah, why don't you just give us a real short 30-second um, summary? Because I, I, I agree 100% with Celie and with Margaret, but I would want them to speak even if I didn't. And I think what we've run into lately is the problem of wanting to build a coalition around all the issues that fit together, anti-racism, anti-war, pro-environment, et, et cetera, et cetera. But then having coalitions around particular issues, including particular wars, where there are people we dramatically disagree with on 18 other things who want to help oppose that one particular war. And it's, you know, it's not a clear call every time. It's a balancing act between wanting to build that uncomfortably large coalition and wanting to stick to all the, th you know, so I think the one thing we have to do is be understanding of each other the, if we disagree on on one of those calls that's been made and you know uh, you, you think that that I should have canceled so and so and then you cancel me like you, we don't need that that sort of ripple effect you know because we're going to all cancel each other out and there's going to be nobody left to say a word um but it's 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 tricky and there's not always a a, a clear answer uh what event to do or not do or who what show to go on or not go on we have to try our best. Thank you very much. And I think you you brought up a whole new dimension of this question, which is how does the, the diversity and the potential offensiveness of our conversation, you know, what does that mean for our effort to build a movement, you know, which is really what this panel is supposed to be about. And we need to do things differently from what we've been doing, because that's certainly not been been working. And and I want to just throw in one uh, one thought on that. Uh, score as well, which is that sometimes when you start working with people that you don't agree with about a lot of things, you begin having larger conversations and then you find yourselves kind of coming into alignment. And, you know, I, uh, during during our 2012 uh, Green Party presidential campaign, we were supported by the Libertarians and we, you know, they had their own candidate, but they wound up supporting us um, because, a lot of them were just being persuaded by the, um, you know, this is like all of them are not officially, but, you know, we had a debate and they voted us the winner of the debate that they hosted because they wound up being persuaded. So when you agree on one thing that can often become a basis and just look at how people who supported, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders then became Trump supporters and, you know, and vice versa. So people are more mobile often than we give them credit for. And, there's an awful lot of um, confusion right now and people wind up adopting certain positions because that's the loudest voice that they happen to hear. So when you start working with people, then suddenly, you know, the input changes and, and things can be much more dynamic than you think that they are. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, someone asked, um, I'd like the speakers to address the role of the two-party system in promoting bipartisan wars and the military budget. Um, that's kind of one question. Let's just work with that one first. What about this two-party system and its role in promoting wars that the two parties agree on? There's not much that they do agree on, but that's one thing they always agree on, pretty much unanimously, almost. Anyone want to jump in on that? Paul, go ahead. Oh, and then I see, all right, David, and then, well, actually, and then let's go to Haig since he has- uh, I'll be question. very short. Are we talking about the Republicans or the Democrats? Democrats, uh, Democrats. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a corporate party. There's really only one, although they fight over each other. And actually a, a fair chunk of the Republican party is now opposed to the Ukraine war and pro- as they're being described as being pro-Russian, but they're saying this is NATO's war, you know, and in Veterans for Peace, we have that same problem. We're divided among our within ourselves over this these issues. 
people have a huge amount of sympathy for the damage and, and the, the pain that the Ukrainian people are going through and don't want to look at the 2014 coup, you know, and and they don't care that we're the United States has been encircling Russia and China. They don't care. It's there. There are people dying in Ukraine. And so it's a real problem. And what we're trying to do is. I don't know, is, is walk the ridge line there and simply say it are, and our positions on Ukraine have been very clear. We want the, we want a ceasefire. We want diplomacy. You got to stop this war and stop the killing. Uh, we're not picking sides with Russia and we're not picking sides with Ukraine. And we're definitely not picking sides with the U.S. and NATO. So. It, it's a problem, I think, throughout the left, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you so much. Hey, jump in. Yeah, um, it's called the Uniparty now by many uh, progressive uh, observers. And it's uh, it's because of the uh, problem with campaign financing. Um, look at the miraculous uh, transformation of AOC from a uh, notionally progressive Democrat into uh uh, the next Nancy Pelosi. I mean, she. Uh, all the Democrats voted for jacking up the already obscene defense budget to uh, a record uh, highs, and uh, only the Republicans opposed for uh, maybe uh, fiscal reasons. But until um, until the main job of uh, congressmen and women is getting is getting funding, um, we're going to have this problem because. Uh, uh, the war machine is uh, very efficient in lobbying for its agenda. So uh, uh, finance reform has to happen uh, before uh, the Congress can work as uh, people's representatives. Over. Great. Thank you. David. Yeah, you know, the, the difference between the Republicans and the Democrats in Congress uh, is not one of war or peace. It's of taking action sometimes or taking action never. Uh, the, the progressive Democrats uh, in the House of so-called representatives, as a matter of principle, uh, do not ever take action or, uh, on anything, uh, whereas Republicans will sometimes withhold their votes until they get what they want. Uh, and so the, the, what the Democrats do is scam us. They introduce a bill called the People Over Pentagon Act to cut $100 billion from whatever the military budget is increased to, just increase it another $100 billion. It's increased three or $400 billion during the time they've been introducing this stupid bill, which would have to pass the Senate and the White House to become an absolutely meaningless law when they could withhold their votes and they could withhold their votes on, on, on the on the procedural votes where they have a chance of getting something, uh, as they did to kill that dirty oil deal, uh, the Manchin oil deal. They bragged about it. They actually did something. Well, the only time I'm ever aware of them having done something, but it was a military spending bill. And, and all they did was stop an oil deal. They didn't do what they claim to stand for and try to reduce military spending. Uh, they don't want to. And the Republicans who oppose the war, they aren't doing a damn thing to oppose the war. They're besides the rhetoric, right? And, and so we have to stop being scammed by both of these criminal cartels uh, and cease identifying with either one of them and put peace over party, put anything over party. It, it, they're disasters. I couldn't agree more. I think many of us feel that way. And I just want to add that the um, the scare tactic, the um, you know, the dreaded spoiler effect, you know, is obsolete. It really doesn't pertain anymore if you are looking at war uh, and censorship, because roles have kind of been reversed there. And certainly on the issue of war, um, the Democrats have been leading the charge now, at least for the last year and more, but now they're really out in front on, on war. So the big boogeyman about why you can't, I mean, I know a number of people who are talking about voting for Trump because he's not as bad as Biden on the war machine. He doesn't have the same wars on his, uh, you know, on his uh, bio, his personal bio that, um, you know, that uh, uh, Biden has. So if you no longer have a lesser evil to worry about, you might as well start voting, you know, what you're really for instead of voting against what you're against. 
and we do need ranked choice voting and to get money out of politics and any political candidate that is not forefronting those two you know, demands is just shilling for the Democrats, basically. It really ought to be um, a litmus test for any candidate who's worth, worth their stuff. Do they actually believe in getting money out of politics and enacting ranked choice voting and proportional representation so that we actually can reclaim the power of our vote, which we don't have under the current system. But people should buck that system now. And anyone who doesn't is really a slave to the Democratic Party. Um, all right, let's see. Another could question. I, uh, just, could I add just one small sure. thing to that? And it's, I guess it's more of a systematic thing than anything. If you go back and look at the rise of Newt Gingrich, what you realize is that one of the things that the Republican Party did very well is that they decided in their position to take back the country one school district at a time. If you look at a lot of what's happening with culture wars and those kind of things. So if you're talking about really getting people to understand that bipartisan isn't really bipartisan. I think some of the work that's being done by folk in the in the peace movement has to also be about taking back curriculums. Because unfortunately, what we are all talking about tonight is how many people just don't know that they're being scammed by both parties, how many people don't know that they're being scammed by corporate America. And that unfortunately starts with the curriculum that we give people K through 12, because as we all know, most people just send their children by, by blindly to the K through 12, thinking that those schools are working in their best interest. And so this is one of the things that we look at as far as how you're getting so much grassroots support. It's about what are we doing to address how people are literally being educated K through 12 and who is writing the curriculum from the state now, that's it. Great points. And I think we could apply all of those, um, you know, those principles to our broader education too. You know, how do we conduct broader public education to, you know, to uh, really uplift a game plan and uh, civic empowerment so that people don't feel like they're confined to, you know, the two very limited choices of war and Wall Street, basically, we need a broader agenda and to communicate that agenda. I know there are a lot of people, you know, that uh, many of us work with who are pondering this all the time. And also, how do we use elections to help do some of that broader education, too? Um, okay, let's very see. Quickly. We are just about coming up on yes. our time. Yes, I want to say something very quickly. Go ahead, Margaret. Um, somebody asked a question about Fred Hampton. You know, it's not true that he uh, just organized with racists. He made demands of this group that they stop being racist. So people should stop saying that he, you know, someone used the word mega, which didn't exist at the time, but he right. insisted that they change their politics before he'd work with them. That's all I have to say. Yes, ex exactly. Thank you for making that note. And there's a question that keeps coming up in the chat here. Um, does anyone want to comment on Jordan Neely, on the Jordan Neely protest and its relationship to the war? I don't know. I think David said it, the, the killer is a, is a ex, they keep calling him ex-Marine. This is a young man who was murdered on a New York City subway a couple of days ago, mm -hmm. mentally ill, unhoused man, uh, this guy decides to stop him from ranting and raving and chokes him to death. And it's on video, apparently. Um, our stupid, horrible, awful mayor, Eric Adams, has said nothing about it, uh, aside from criticizing AOC because of a tweet she loves to tweet, And at any rate. But that's, the, that's what I know about the killer. Apparently, they know his identity. Uh, I, unless there's a late breaking story, I don't think his name has been given to the public, although it's clear they know who he is. Oh, but thank you. What AOC did was watch a video of one man murdering another while other people stood by and watched and filmed it and called it a murder. Uh, the mayor of New York uh, objects to calling a murder that you can watch on video on your computer right now, no problem, a murder. 
Uh, and the police, in fact, uh, spoke with the man and let him go. Uh, you know, there was no mystery about who he was. Uh, right. He was the white guy with the blonde hair trained to kill by the U.S. government, killing somebody while other people stood there and watched or helped him. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the, the, the New York media and the U.S. media depict it as and talk about it as a deadly incident they don't say so and so killed somebody uh and and they make the whole story about how annoying the dead guy was so that if you're a poor black guy who's hungry uh and you're and you're bothering anyone on a subway hey not a problem we'll take care of it we'll murder him for you this this is you know, this is the story. Uh, it, 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 a murder isn't a murder. If you're black, if you're poor, and if you're bothering people on the fucking subway, mm -hmm. it, you know, this is where we've arrived at if we were ever anywhere else. And you can't separate the two. You can't have a country that gives itself the right to kill all over the world and uh, many, uh, many times killing people who aren't white and then express surprise when we have a mass shooting or a, a, a racist killing on the subway. Exactly. This is kind of a microcosm of what we're talking about here tonight and the problem that we are mobilizing to um, have a revolution against. And to close us out, shall we just do a very quick round robin, 30 to 60 seconds maximum, just if you have any closing thoughts to share? Uh, I would say we have to take these opportunities to study when these anniversaries come along, uh, to learn about Kent State or Jackson State or all of the things that we've mentioned, to learn about Daniel Ellsberg or why he was important um, and debate each other. And we cannot be afraid of struggling with each other about these issues. And thanks to everybody who worked so hard to put this together and all the panels. Awesome. Thank you, Margaret. Haig, do you want to jump in? Oh, it's an honor to be uh, on this panel. I was most impressed by all of the speakers, and I hope <laughs> all of this energy converges into uh, a more powerful force that can actually uh, achieve some, uh, some real change. Thanks to you all. Paul? Uh, I'll just uh, ditto what Haig just said. Thank you so much. It's it's been uh, been eye opening actually, um, and uh, there is so much agreement in in among us uh, how we get that into the bowels of Oklahoma. I don't know, but we got to work on it. Thank you, Seely. Two quick things. One, um, we have to learn to be more nuanced. Just because I disagree with you with one thing doesn't mean I disagree with you with everything and work to find things where we can all agree. Secondly, it would be remiss of me to discuss Jackson State University and not discuss in closing the legal disenfranchisement of Black Mississippians that's happening right now in Jackson, Mississippi, in the state of Mississippi. It is the same war machine. It is the, it is the same white citizen council that are essentially trying to take water from Black people, trying to take voting rights from Black people, and trying to take economic rights from Black people by simply passing laws. Right now, they're passing laws in the state of Mississippi that says that Black people cannot elect their own officials, Black people cannot elect their own judges, and Black people cannot uh, manage their own, their own funding for their water. There's going to be a big lawsuit about that. So this whole notion about the legal disenfranchisement of people, and part of this is they're expanding the downtown district, essentially taking Jackson from the citizens of Jackson, Mississippi, and giving it to a police department that's a state police department and not a city police department. And so Black people right now are being colonized in Jackson, Mississippi, in the same way that the American empire is colonizing people all over the world. Thank y'all for having me. Well, thank you so much, David. Well, I appreciate everything I've learned here, and I would just close on this National Day of Prayer that by uh, praying that we abolish nations uh, before they abolish us. Thank you so much, and I'll just close in um, thanking 
all of our amazing powerhouse speakers and all of our powerhouse uh, participants. And I think uh, what I have been reminded of tonight is just uh, how much we are more than the sum of our parts that together uh, we're unstoppable. So let's keep it happening. And I look forward to continuing conversations. Thank you, Jill. Thanks, Jill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, we all we all send out and let us know when y'all post it so people can share it. You know, post the recording. Let us know. We'll do. Absolutely. Take care, everybody. Good night.